The Hesla people are a First Nation of Canada that live at the mouth of the Douglas Channel on the coast of British Columbia. They have occupied their lands for an estimated 9,000 years. They are a resilient and powerful nation that has survived colonization and the Hesla people are still thriving today. According to scholars, the Hesla were contacted by European settlers in the mid-1770s by Captain James Cook. Following contact with the Europeans, the Hesla people began a difficult journey through colonization, assimilation, disease, and abuse. It is believed that the Hesla population dropped from several thousands of people before contact with the Europeans to a little over a thousand people in the mid-1900s. The Hesla are an amalgamation of two nations. The Kitlop, Hanasala, and the Kitmat people joined together in the 1900s after their populations were decimated by disease and a natural disaster. The Hesla traditionally had a social system based on matrilineal clans. There were eight clans, the eagle, beaver, raven, crow, killer whale, salmon, wolf, and frog, but epidemics brought by the Europeans reduced the population to the point that the wolf and frog clans disappeared. The Hesla nations are renowned for their skill of Ulichan fishing and the creation of Ulichan oil used to cure illnesses, cook food, and make candles out of. They are a fishing people and the Douglas Channel is vital to their livelihood. The Douglas Channel also provided excellent means of transportation so that they could trade their Ulichan grease with various neighboring nations. The Hesla had significant intermarriages between other nations and maintained a close relationship with the Shimshan, whom the Hesla enjoyed economic and social relations with. The Hesla are part of the Waukeshaan language family and this allied them with other nations who are part of this family in what is now called British Columbia. The name Waukeshaan was given to the language family by Captain James Cook in 1778 when he visited the area. The Waukesha nations are powerful people who carve elaborate totem poles, canoes, and homes out of cedar. After contact by the Europeans, the Waukesha were nearly decimated by epidemics brought by the Europeans. A series of diseases hit the Hesla people and decimated their population from 1770 to the mid-1900s. Smallpox, malaria, influenza, and measles became common epidemics in the communities. When the Kitimat people and the Kitlope were rendered almost extinct by smallpox, the two nations formed together to prevent their further decimation. There was also a large avalanche in Miskusa, a Kitlope village, that wiped out smallpox survivors, and this is another reason for the amalgamation of the nations. European disease was not the only impact settlers had on the Hesla people. In 1876, a Hesla man heard a sermon from Reverend W. Pollard in Victoria, who baptized him and renamed him Charlie Amos. The man's Hesla name was Wax Gamalayu, and he returned to Kitimat village to share his newfound beliefs, and he began to convert people to Christianity. Due to the remoteness of the Hesla villages, the nation was isolated for a long period of time, and it was not until 1890 that settlers settled in Kitimat village and established a residential school. The Elizabeth Long Memorial Home was a residential school from 1894 to 1941, and the missionaries at the school worked hard to assimilate the indigenous children into Christian society. In the late 1880s, the residential school began boarding children from numerous First Nations communities in British Columbia. A cannery named Butadel opened near Kitimat Village, where people of many neighboring nations came to can their fish for the winter. Butadel became known as the pickup place for Hesla and other indigenous children who were relocated to the residential schools from 1888 to 1983. The mortality rate at the Elizabeth Long Memorial Home was close to 50% due to disease, exposure, and lack of sanitation. In addition to residential schools being used to assimilate the Hesla into European society, the Canadian government established a ban against the potlatch ceremony from 1884 to 1951. The potlatch, an important social ceremony that redistributes wealth among the high slip community, was made illegal and destroyed the Hesla social economy. The ban also prevented gift giving among people and as the potlatch was an important ceremony, the ban also ruined many social practices. Through residential schools and the potlatch ban, the Hesla language became obsolete and there are few speakers left. During the time of residential schooling, disease and potlatch bans, the Hesla culture continued to survive against all odds. Elements of the potlatch appeared at weddings and church holidays as described by Margaret Butcher in her journals depicting everyday life at the Elizabeth Long Memorial Home from 1916 to 1919. In addition, families continued to fish for Ulichan and made the popular grease. The people who belonged to the Waukeshaan language nations were known for carving their elaborate totem poles, a practice that was not eliminated by residential schools or other efforts of assimilation. The Gepskolax totem pole was carved by Chief Gepskolax in 1872 and stood as a commemoration to the people who died from smallpox and influenza in Miskusa. In 1927, a Swedish royal consult 
cut the pole down and shipped it to Sweden where it was housed for over half a century. The Hesla people discovered their stolen pole in the Swedish Museum of Ethnography in 1991, creating their sacred totem pole. It was not until 2006 that the Hesla people were able to take the Gepskolex pole back to their territory, and they became the first nation to repatriate a totem pole from overseas. In exchange for its safe return, the Hesla carved a replica pole to give to the museum in Stockholm. Derek Wilson, a totem pole carver, explains the Hesla history by saying, Everything our people did was criminalized. Hunting, fishing, dancing, singing, carving, and language was all against the law. The thing that almost destroyed our people is the lack of connection to our past. When things were taken away from us, we lost that connection. The Hesla people are continuing to fight for their land and their way of life. Their location at the mouth of the Douglas Channel is beneficial for the Canadian government and private corporations as the coast makes trade with Asia and the United States simpler. The Hesla have seen environmental impacts from companies coming near their territory and not respecting the environment. In 1970, Eurocan built a pulp and paper mill that resulted in the pollution of waterways and the ecosystem suffered. The Hesla have also advocated against pipelines and have protested the traffic of ships in their waterways that all impact Tesla territory and their way of life. Today, the Hesla people are a strong nation. They have a total registered population of 1,800 people, with half of them living in Kitimat Village. The nation has successfully repatriated their totem pole and recently won a comprehensive land claim. The Hesla First Nation Council filed a comprehensive land claim for 10,360 square kilometers. This land claim demonstrated that the Hesla people have managed to keep their territory without ceding it for time immemorial, and in 2015, the BC Ministry of Aboriginal Relations and Reconciliation agreed to transfer 120 hectares of Crown land back to the Hesla Nation. The Hesla Nation is also a member of Marine Planning Partnership for the North Pacific Coast to make recommendations of sustainable economic development, and over the past 10 years, the nation has been involved in over a dozen joint ventures with industries in the region. The Hesla people have had to overcome serious obstacles implemented by a racist ideology of discovery and civilization, and have suffered at the hands of colonialism and assimilation. These processes are not finished, and the Hesla people are continuing to fight for their land, their language, and their communities. Research about the Hesla people is difficult to find. While currently the nation is growing and becoming a strong voice on the coast of British Columbia, much of their history was not documented. Government documents show a strong push for assimilation and the implementation of Indian acts and bans on social practices were made strategically and with the purpose of removing the Indian problem from land coveted by settlers and later the Canadian government. Diaries about residential schools show a lack of compassion for children and an intolerance to the Hesla ways of life. The omission of so much information clearly stems from a purposeful neglect of documentation or lack of interest in Hesla ways of life. Important Hesla people have been excluded from historical texts, and much of the accessible information about the Hesla nation has been written by Canadian or European sources, showing a clear bias against the Indigenous nation. By studying First Nations and following their history up until the present day, we can combat against an intentional lack of information about First Nations and we can start to end the racism and ignorance portrayed against Indigenous peoples.